Christopher Nolan has an unusual perspective on story. From the non-linear plots of his early thrillers to the parallel narratives of Inception and Interstellar, his work continually explores the different storytelling techniques that add depth to a film. Yet while many of cinema's great storytellers will disguise their artifice, Nolan leaves his out in the open. His films encourage us to not only experience the story, but to think about how that story is presented to us. And maybe to ask ourselves about the very nature of stories. How do we use narrative to understand the world around us? And what does a storyteller stand to gain or lose if we believe him? Nolan explores these questions best in his Batman trilogy, especially in the second and third installments. Batman Begins deserves a lot of credit for kickstarting this new and grittier portrayal of Gotham City and its residents. I gotta get me one of those. But The Dark Knight and The Dark Knight Rises offer up a nuanced and at times contradictory perspective on the ability stories have to shape the world. Before we dive in, this goes without saying, but. The first 15 minutes of The Dark Knight is one of the greatest openings in all of film history. It's exciting and tense, and it hooks our attention while simultaneously planting the seeds of multiple storylines that will flower and bear fruit over the course of the movie. For our purposes here, I want to look not so much at the events of the story, a bank heist, a fist fight in a parking garage, an attempted courtroom assassination but at how these pieces of the narrative unfold. I know why they call him the Joker. So why Nolan the introduces Joker? his three principal characters, the Joker, Batman, Harvey Dent, by repeating the same two-part process. First, we hear other characters talking about him. Who does everyone else think he is? Then, we see him in action and ask ourselves, does he really fit the narrative that's built up around him? Is the Joker just some nut job in war paint? Not. No, I'm not. Is Batman a dangerous criminal, a hero, a creature of myth? Is Harvey Dent really Gotham's pure white knight? The film never gives easy answers to these questions. They're largely matters of opinion anyway, with the right answers, depending on which narratives we, and Nolan's characters, choose to believe. And The Dark Knight is filled with these kinds of debates. Who's more corrupt, the DA's staff or Gordon's? Should Batman turn himself in? What motivates the criminal mind? And how far should we be willing to go in order to stop it? In this context, Heath Ledger's Joker is the perfect antagonist. In a world filled with competing narratives, here's a man with no biography. I think in his pockets but knives and lint. A man whose origin story changes dramatically depending on his audience. A master storyteller who knows exactly how to manipulate his listeners' emotions. He claims he has no idea what he's doing. I'm a dog chasing cars. But the entire film is a series of impeccably crafted plans, all executed by the clown prince himself. All his claims of randomness seem to be a smokescreen. Behind it, He's dedicated himself to a single, unified narrative. I'll show you. When the chips are down, these, uh, these civilized people, they'll eat each other. People are inherently violent, selfish, and cruel. And civilization's so fragile. All it takes is a little push. <laughs> the Joker tries to validate this narrative in two ways. First, he manipulates the disfigured Harvey Dent, sending him on a vengeance-fueled rampage, resulting in the deaths of several cops, mobsters, and eventually Dent himself. Second, he orchestrates a classic prisoner's dilemma involving two fairies, one loaded with civilians, the other prisoners from Arkham. He's wired both fairies with explosives, then planted the detonators to each on board the other fairy. Both boats are given a choice. If one of them blows up the other, the Joker will let the remaining boat leave Gotham. If neither ferry detonates the explosives, the Joker will blow them both up at midnight. 
A great deal of drama is built around the decision-making process. Can they trust the people on the other boat not to kill them? In the end, of course, no one blows up. The ferry passengers don't use their detonators, and Batman stops the Joker from using his failsafe. At first, this seems like a full-throated refutation of the Joker's core narrative, that people will turn on each other at the drop of a hat, and a validation of Batman's faith in humanity. This city just showed you that it's full of people ready to believe in good. But the thing is, the people on board the ferries don't choose to do the right thing. On the prison ferry, the detonator is taken by force and tossed out a porthole. On the civilian ferry, the question is very properly put to a vote. Very proper ballots are cast and properly tallied. It's all very civilized. And the result is an overwhelming majority in favor of blowing up the other boat. But the captain refuses, and the man who volunteers to take his place loses his nerve at the last moment. It's not faith in humanity that saves them, but cowardice. Everybody wants to detonate the bomb. No one wants to get their hands dirty. Later, of course, they'll reassure themselves. It was their better angels that prevailed that day. They stood up for what was right. Probably on a basic level, they need to believe that, much like they need to believe in the untouchable virtue of Harvey Dent. Just as they need to believe that things will be all right, that everything is going according to plan. These stories might all be complete bullshit, Tato. but maybe they're necessary fictions if we want to go on living with ourselves. The Joker cannot win. And maybe, the Dark Knight says, we're better off not knowing the truth. Ha, ha, ooh, he, ha, ha, ha. I thought my jokes were bad. The Dark Knight Rises turns this idea on its head. Eight years after Harvey Dent's death, our remaining characters have paid a heavy price for their lies. Gordon's family left him, and now he's considering telling the truth about Harvey Dent and resigning as police commissioner. He's tired of the hypocrisy. Alfred is racked with guilt. See, in the dark night, he burned Rachel's letter, hoping to spare Bruce the pain of her choosing Harvey Dent. But now, Bruce thinks she intended to wait for him, and he's consumed by grief. Bruce's body is failing him, too. Years of obsessive devotion to an ideal have left him with no cartilage in his knees, damaged kidneys, and concussive head trauma. Finally, by taking the fall for Two-Face's crimes at the end of the last movie, Bruce has made Batman so reviled in Gotham that the entire police force abandons pursuit of actual criminals for the chance to capture the man who murdered Harvey Dent. It seems the stories that our heroes peddled in the last movie might not have been the best idea. And the news stories introduced in The Dark Knight Rises are, if anything, even more dangerous. As in The Dark Knight, the film's opening is more than just a great action set piece. In crashing the plane, Bane and his followers convince the world that nuclear physicist Leonid Pavel is dead. Dr. Pavel was believed to be the only man in the world capable of weaponizing a nuclear fusion reactor like the one at Wayne Enterprises. With him dead, there's less reason to fear the reactor falling into the wrong hands. Of course, Pavel isn't really dead. Not yet. And Miranda Tate's reactor is far less secure than the good guys imagine. When Bane seizes control of Gotham, he cloaks his actions in the rhetoric of a liberator. He exposes the truth about Harvey Dent, and casts Gordon and the others involved in the cover-up as corrupt, power-hungry elites. Bane then urges the people to claim what is rightfully yours. As the occupation wears on, riots break out. The rich and powerful are brought low, robbed, beaten, sentenced in kangaroo courts for crimes real or imagined. Given that the film came out in 2012, it's tempting to read this as an analogy for the political climate of the time. And critics have, with some calling it a conservative critique of the Occupy movement, and others a left-wing takedown of the Tea Party. 
But these interpretations ignore one basic fact. Bain's revolution is only smoke and mirrors. He claims that the bomb will only be detonated if people try to escape Gotham or if an outside force comes to the city's rescue. In truth, the bomb is rigged to explode in a few months no matter what happens. Class warfare is just a distraction, so no one has time to stop the reactor from reducing the entire city to rubble. And that's Bane's goal all along. Not revolution, not conquest, but total destruction. And despite his carefully crafted reputation as a mercenary, his motive is not money. It's not political either. It's love. Perhaps the most insidious story in The Dark Knight Rises is the legend of the child who escaped. After Bane defeats Batman in physical combat, he tosses him into an underground prison. There, Bruce hears of a child born within those prison walls, the only person to ever successfully climb to freedom. He realizes that the child in the story was fathered by Ra's al Ghul, his own mentor, and the chief antagonist of Batman Begins. Knowing that Bane, too, was a student of Ra's al Ghul, Bruce surmises that Bane is the child in the legend. He eventually escapes the prison himself and returns to Gotham to prevent Bane from fulfilling his father's mission. There's just one problem. Bane is not the child of Ra's al Ghul. Huh? I am. In fact, he's not even the one pulling the strings here. The actual child of the legend is Miranda Tate, real name Talia al Ghul. She's won Bruce over with stories of her poor childhood and wormed her way into the inner circle of the resistance, sabotaging their efforts from within. And now, Bruce is so certain that Bane was the escaped child, he never considers another interpretation of the story until Talia sticks a dagger between his ribs. Her choice of weapon is of particular interest. Recall that in The Dark Knight, Bruce went to Lucius Fox asking him for a way to make the bat suit lighter. He needed to move faster and more freely to be more symbol than man. Batman has no limits. The resulting suit is lighter, but it comes at a cost. Separation of the plates makes you more vulnerable to knives and gunfire. Oh, we wouldn't want to make things too easy now, would we? Ultimately, it's his dedication to this story of the unstoppable Batman, which has left him vulnerable to Talia's betrayal. You failed. I think this is the point where Bruce realizes something. If he wants to survive, he needs to let go of the stories he's been clinging to that he's more than a man, that his lost love would wait for him forever, that it's his destiny to die saving his city. The Dark Knight tells us that sometimes we need the fictions in order to keep on living in this world. Yeah, sometimes the truth isn't good enough. The Dark Knight Rises says that sometimes the stories are what holds us back. Maybe it's time we all stop trying to outsmart the truth and let it have its day. And it's the truth that sets us free. Hey, film dorks, what's going on? Hope everybody enjoyed my take on Christopher Nolan's Batman movies. I'd actually never seen The Dark Knight Rises prior to this month. Um, and I was really surprised at how well it responds to so many of the ideas presented in The Dark Knight. I just, I, I had to do something about that. I would like to take this moment to apologize to my mother-in-law, a die-hard Adam West fan. Deb, if you made it all the way through this video, I'm sorry. All in all, I was really impressed with Christopher Nolan's movies. I didn't get to see all of them this month. I didn't end up re-watching Dunkirk, although I saw that when it was in theaters a couple years ago. I still haven't seen Tenet, but overall very strong films all the way across the board. So guys, let me hear your thoughts. What's your favorite Christopher Nolan film? Who do you think is the best Batman? 
If you enjoyed this video, I hope you'll consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. Unless your favorite Batman is George Clooney, then you go straight to movie jail. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. I hope everyone else is staying safe, happy, and well, and I'll see you on the flip side. Ooh.